Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship. It's Sunday, the 14th of February, and it is good to welcome you wherever you are and whatever time you join with us. Uh, this again today, if you are watching um, at around 10, 10.30, we will be having our coffee and catch up hour beginning at 11 a.m. Um, and that is via Zoom. If you are in receipt of the Worship at Home sheet, you will have the Zoom link for that. And if you've joined us on any previous weeks, it's the same link that we've used before. But if you're joining us for the first time today and you don't have the link, if you send, put a note on the church Facebook page or send me an email and I will share that link with you. Um, the delivery of the Lent bags um, has been, de well, was delayed a little bit because of the weather, um, but they should, by the time this goes out, I'm recording this on Friday morning, but by the time this goes out, um, I would hope that at least half of them will be out, and they will all be out by Tuesday, so you will have it in time for Ash Wednesday, um, which is the first bit in the bag that you will be using. So um, if you haven't yet got it, you will be getting it, so don't worry about that. The Lent Bible Study and Discussion Group is going to begin on Thursday the 25th of February, um, on, on, again, on Zoom, um, we have a good list of people and I will be sending out the Zoom link and all the information about that um, during the week coming. So if you, ha if you want to join and you haven't told me yet, then let me know as soon as possible. But um, I do, we do have a lot of people wanting to be part of it this, this time, so that's really encouraging. Um, so that, again, is starting on the 25th of February, and we're going to have time reading and discussing uh, Jesus' last phrases, the words he spoke from the cross. Our worship team will be meeting this week on Thursday the 18th um, just to discuss the way we're doing worship at the moment and all of those sorts of things. So that's just really for your information. We're also planning a spring edition of the Westwards magazine, um, which will be available via email or in print before Easter. If you've got news stories or information that you'd like to share with us all, please let Karen know. Uh, the deadline for entries is the 9th of March. The midweek worship service at Larbit East is um, up and running again, but is live streamed because, of course, we're not allowed to worship in church together at the moment. But that's um, every Thursday morning at 11.15. Um, on their YouTube channel, and I will be um, leading that service on Thursday the 25th. Today, you have a treat. We have a treat. Um, my good friend, uh, the Reverend Marcy Glass, is um, the senior pastor at Calvary Presbyterian Church in San Francisco, and um, she is preaching today. She has shared a transfiguration sermon and that will be there for all of us to enjoy and to reflect on. So my thanks to her for being willing to share that and thanks also go to John and Anne for our prayers today. We're going to pause now as we listen to our introit.
Good morning. Let us join together in our opening prayer. Let us pray. This day, as our all days, loving God, is the day to worship you. This time, as are all times, loving God, is the time to give you praise. This moment, as are all moments, loving God, is the moment to turn to you in faith. Today you are our loving God. Loving Father, be with us now, renewing us with your creative love to be surrounded by a world of beauty and wonder. To awake from a refreshed sleep, to see the glory of the seasons, the warmth in the sun, the coolness in the breeze, and the dampness of the rain. We love to see and feel what you have created and know the love of you as creator. Loving Son, be with us now, bringing forgiveness through your saving love. We feel the pain you feel when we do not care for what you have created. Our use of fossil fuels, the destruction of the forests and the pollution of your seas with plastic. All of this for our own gain and not for your glory. We pray for your forgiveness and help. Help us to change our habits and to heal the world from our neglect. Loving Spirit, be with us now. Strengthen us with your everlasting love to be surrounded in the atmosphere of worship, albeit not physical, still spiritual to feel a sense of purpose of following our faith. We come with a longing to know more about God and how to love him more. We know that you are in our midst, scattered widely, but bound together by you. Loving God, Father, Son and Spirit, as we worship today, May we be built up in love. Build us up as a community as we pray together in the unity of your love, praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours forever. Amen. It's fine. Our, our first hymn this morning is At the Name of Jesus, Every Knee Shall Bow.
observant amongst you will realise that I'm not in church and I'm now in my study instead. Um, we had a slight blip in the middle of the recording that was done in church, so I'm now re-recording the family talk. Everything else will continue to be in church or other places, depending on who's recorded it. Have you ever climbed a mountain? Or have you at least scrambled to the top of a hill? I think one of the best things about getting to the top is the view. You can see farther and you're able to spot other places too. The second best thing about climbing up high is the sense of achievement that we get because it takes considerable effort and lots of energy to do it. The Bible is full of all sorts of different mountaintop experiences. Times when the old prophets climbed up high so that they could get closer to God or spend time communicating with God. Today's Bible story tells of a mountaintop experience that is considered so important that we tell the story every year. Matthew and Luke record it too and today we're hearing Mark's retelling of course. Jesus was joined by two of the Old Testament prophets who'd also had mountaintop experiences with God, Moses and Elijah. Jesus' appearance mysteriously changes. And for the three special friends who had joined Jesus, it was truly an awesome experience. I imagine that Peter and James and John would have been happy to stay up on the mountain with Jesus and, the, and Moses and Elijah and just revel in what they were witnessing. But of course they couldn't because their experience wasn't about the mountaintop at all. The purpose of this experience was to renew them to encourage them, to strengthen Jesus and to prepare them for the difficult days that were ahead of them. So Jesus, after they'd had witnessed this extraordinary experience, seen the prophets, heard God's voice confirming again who Jesus really was. Finally, Jesus takes them back down the mountainside getting ready for the days that lay ahead. From the top of the mountain to the valley below. See, we all need mountaintop experiences from time to time. Whether it's a holiday up in the hills or um, maybe actually what you need is not a mountain but the sea. Whatever it is, taking a break from the ordinary and taking ourselves to somewhere extraordinary helps us to cope with all of the stress and the, the pulling of which way, every which way that ordinary life gives us. We need mountaintop experiences also in our faith journey, in our journey with Jesus. We need those experiences because they renew us for difficult tasks that we face so that we're able to be our best, to do our best as we follow Jesus every day. Let's pray for a moment. We thank you, God, for showing us the long history and bright future of your people from Moses through to Elijah, to Peter and James and John. To us. Help us to find confidence in those stories of old, that we can better follow you in our lives, that we can love each other, that we can be kind to each other, and that we are able to love you every day of our lives. Amen.
readings this morning are from the Gospel of Mark, starting at chapter 8, at verse 27, Peter's declaration about Jesus. Then Jesus and his disciples went away to the villages near Caesarea Philippi. On the way he asked them, Tell me, who do people say I am? Some say you are John the Baptist, they answered. Others say that you are Elijah, while others say you are one of the prophets. What about you? he asked them. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Messiah. Then Jesus ordered them, Do not tell anyone about me. Then Jesus began to teach his disciples, The Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. He will be put to death, but three days later he will rise to life. He made this very clear to them. So Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But Jesus turned round, looked at the disciples, and rebuked Peter. Get away from me, Satan, he said. Your thoughts don't come from God, but from man. Later in chapter 9, at verse 3, we read about the transfiguration. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James and John and led them up to a high mountain where they were alone. As they looked on, a change came over Jesus and his clothes became shining white, whiter than anyone in the world could wash them. Then the three disciples saw Elijah and Moses talking with Jesus. Peter spoke up and said to Jesus, Teacher, how good it is that we are here. We will make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He and the others were so frightened that he did not know what to say. Then a cloud appeared and covered them with its shadow, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my own dear son. Listen to him. They took a quick look round, but did not see anyone else. Only Jesus was with them. As they came down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has risen from death. Amen. And may God add his blessing to these readings from his holy word. It gives me great pleasure now to introduce my friend, Marcy, uh, to share a word with us this morning. Under normal circumstances, you would have met her um, as we were all planning a trip to Iona together last year. Um, we're hopeful that we will have that trip to Iona next year, so you might get to meet her then, who knows. But for now, this is Marcy Glass preaching from San Francisco in Calvary Presbyterian Church. Today is Transfiguration Sunday, and each year before we enter the season of Lent, and as we leave the season of Epiphany, we spend some time looking at the texts of Jesus' transfiguration when he takes a few of his disciples and goes up on the mountainside. Matthew, Mark, and Luke each tell a story a little differently, and this year the lectionary gives us Mark's account. For Mark, this story is about identity. Jesus asks his disciple who people are saying he is. Some say Moses, some say Elijah, they tell him. Who do you say that I am? He asks. And Peter says, you are the Messiah. Awareness of Jesus' identity is growing for the disciples, but they don't fully understand this Messiah they are following quite yet. We also have religious authorities who have no idea who Jesus really is, but they've seen enough to decide they want to try to kill him and silence his calls for justice and inclusion. Mark puts the transfiguration smack dab in the center of his gospel, ready to give us the clearest image yet of who Jesus is. And for Mark, Jesus is standing in a long line of prophets who have been persecuted by the powers that be. 
Who do you say that Jesus is? That may be an easy question for you to answer. I know there are many people who can give an, a straight answer to that question without even having to think about it. And if you're one of those people, that's great and really important because the world needs people who can share their clarity of faith in ways that is hopeful and loving. For many of us, though, I know it is a much more complicated answer. Maybe we love Jesus, but we don't quite know what to do with some of his followers. Maybe that makes us wonder if we're on the right track. Or maybe we think we have a handle on the whole identity of Jesus one week, and then we hear a different Bible story, and we feel we're back at square one. So if you ever find yourself as a doubter or a questioner or a skeptic or even a cynic, this Bible story is for you. Because the only thing in it that seems clear to me is that clarity about Jesus is a process. Nobody in this passage gets it right the first time. First, we have the story of the healing of the blind man at Bethsaida. And people often talk about this story as if Jesus somehow makes a mistake in his healing or somehow doesn't know what he's doing when he tries to heal him the first time. Now, I'm all for Jesus being fully human, but because of all of the other verses all around this story, I don't think this is a scenario where Jesus doesn't know what he's doing. In the story right before it, the disciples, remember those superheroes who were doing all of the right things? Well, they've been replaced with people who lack clarity about their Jesus. Jesus had fed thousands of people on a hillside with just a few loaves of bread. The disciples were there. The disciples saw it happen. And almost immediately, we're told that they're in a boat and nobody remembered to bring bread and they're wondering how they're going to eat. And Jesus says, for real, were you not just there with me on the hillside? Do you not remember? Their clarity about who Jesus is seems to come in and out of focus like trees walking. And then after they meet the man from Bethsaida, Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? Peter gives the right answer. You are the Messiah. Peter has some ability to see Jesus. But then Jesus starts teaching about what messiahship will look like, suffering, rejection, death, resurrection. And Peter rebukes Jesus. This does not, this description does not fit with Peter's expectations and hopes and wants for what the Messiah was going to be, who he was going to, what he was going to do, how he was going to conquer. Jesus seems to realize Peter can only see him like trees walking. Get behind me, Satan, Jesus says. I always hear that rebuke of Peter as a harsh thing. It's the last thing I ever want Jesus to say to me. But Jesus doesn't say, go away from me forever, Peter. He doesn't tell Peter to get lost. He tells Peter to get behind him. Peter doesn't have true clarity about Jesus yet. He has to keep following. If anyone wants to become my follower, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. So if we really want clarity about Jesus, we have to keep on following him. Because just when we think he has come into focus, he looks like a tree walking. And so we heed his call to get behind him and we keep on following. To see Jesus clearly, we walk behind him as he heads towards suffering and death. Take up your cross and follow me. His followers would not have heard people call them to take up a cross because that wasn't a symbol of faith in their day. It was an actual form of torture and death for political prisoners of Rome. Take up your cross would have been an unfamiliar and a troubling call. His followers would more often have heard calls to take up your sword and follow me. And I think maybe that's more what Peter had in mind when he was calling Jesus the Messiah. To take up one's cross and follow Jesus is to deny one's self. And denying yourself doesn't mean giving up chocolate for Lent, although you can do that if it helps you focus on discipleship. Denying yourself is not about pretending you don't have needs that matter in the world. Ched Myers, in his commentary on Mark, Say to This Mountain, writes, the gospel invitation to deny self challenges the self as the center of the universe. It calls us out of life centered in individualism and self-interest 
and into life according to God's love. The call to follow, then, is a call to walk in a path of radical love that challenges oppressive power structures. It might have been easy for Peter, after he rebuked Jesus and then was soundly rebuked by Jesus in turn, to focus on self and his wounded ego. I can imagine slinking away in shame if Jesus had given me that talking to, no matter how much I deserved it. But Peter keeps his focus on Jesus' call to follow behind him, and he stays. And Peter goes up on the mountain with Jesus where the transfiguration happens. From seeing Jesus only partly clearly, Peter is there when Jesus is shining like the sun and talking to Moses and Elijah. Maybe the transfiguration was a little too clear for Peter. It occurred to me this week that if American Christianity, broadly speaking, were to write the biblical story, we would reverse it. In Mark's gospel, Jesus tells the crowds to take up their cross, to deny their self-centered goals, to follow him. It's the big audience. The big crowds in this story get the difficult message. The transfiguration, where Jesus speaks, God speaks, and Jesus shines like the sun, that happens to a really small group away from the crowd away from the cameras. American Christianity would be promoting the transfiguration for the crowds. I don't know how much attention we'd give to the discipleship message at all. Come to the arena Saturday night, one night only, and see Jesus like you've never seen him before, shiny and talking to dead prophets. God will speak from the rafters, and you don't want to miss this once-in-a-lifetime evangelism rally. That's how we'd sell it, isn't it? When Peter, James, and John walked up the mountain with Jesus, the media wasn't there. The politicians didn't get photo ops, and the disciples didn't record God's voice so they could put it on TikTok later. Instead, we're told, he didn't know what to say, for they were terrified. And I've always assumed it was Peter who didn't know what to say, because he often doesn't seem to know the right thing to say. But I wonder if maybe it was Jesus who didn't know what to say when he saw the terrified faces of his disciples. I wonder if Jesus saw something more clearly on that mountain too. Maybe he saw the love of Peter who stayed with him after the rebukes. Maybe he saw how hard it is for humans to clearly see divine glory, to clearly understand divine intentions. Maybe Jesus didn't know what to say, for they were terrified. And in that moment, the cloud showed up and God's voice chimes in. Jesus didn't know what to say to his friends. He didn't know how to comfort them. He didn't know how to assuage their fears. But God did. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. God's voice here harkens back to Jesus' baptism, another divine human encounter that maybe was easier to see for the disciples. God's voice reminds them to listen to Jesus. It reminds them that the person who is teaching them the hard lessons about discipleship now is the person who called them back at the beginning of their journey. I don't know that hearing God's voice would completely end my terror, actually, but I do appreciate the gesture. The transfiguration for me is a reminder of the divine intention to draw close to humanity in love, to comfort, to bring clarity and understanding. Lent will begin this week on Ash Wednesday. Lent is a season of preparation, approximately six weeks of time for us to prepare for Easter, where we deny our self-centered concerns and take up God's call for radical justice and love. So as we prepare to enter a season of Lent, I pray we will listen for how God's voice is trying to comfort and help us in prayer, through each other, in other moments throughout our days, even in this strange pandemic time where our days are not what we wish they were. God is still speaking. Do we trust that? I pray we will seek clarity and give each other grace when it all seems like trees walking. Our journey now is down the mountain, following Jesus headed for the cross and on our journey of discipleship.
So blessings, friends, on this journey. Amen. Let us come together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for the opportunity to worship together on this Lord's Day as a church of your people. We come before you to sing your praises, to listen to your word and to reflect upon it, to give thanks and seek your will for this world, for our friends and families. We give thanks for the gifts of time, talents and money and offer these back to you so that they can be used for the furtherance of your kingdom here on earth. We pray for the charitable organisations who are finding these times difficult and ask that you keep reminding us to contribute to them as we are able. We remember the words of James who wrote, Faith without action is dead. Help us, Lord, to keep these words at the forefront of our minds. Lord, we are weary of this enforced lockdown which to some feels like imprisonment or at least house arrest. Help us to remember Paul, who used his time in prison to communicate with others through the epistles. Today we have many ways to communicate and we give thanks for these. However, Lord, there are those who are unable to use these and we pray that they too can experience your presence and your love. The disadvantaged in our society deserve our prayers. The poor, the ill, the homeless, the dispossessed and the hungry. May they open their eyes, ears and heart to you and receive the love you radiate. Our world is at war with the virus and many will find today a day of darkness and of pain. Help us, Lord, to help them see the light of your love to reduce their anxieties and to look forward in faith. There are many concerns which trouble our hearts and minds and we may have to face them for many more weeks, but we have faith and trust in the one alone who is trustworthy and we pray that Jesus holds us gently in his hands. Our children and young people are finding this time difficult with restriction to their schooling, to their friends and other activities. Lord, we pray that they are not disadvantaged by these extraordinary times. And we give thanks for teachers, parents and guardians who are giving of their time and talents and energy to provide schooling and recreation for the young. Likewise, Lord, we give thanks and ask your blessing on those who have soldiered on throughout the pandemic, providing care in hospitals, care homes and elsewhere. For those who are grieving, we offer our prayers in the hope that they will be surrounded by your love. The whole world is affected by this virus and we are aware that health care deficiencies, adverse weather, political unrest will influence what can be achieved in many countries. We pray that the people of the world are supported by caring governments, scientists and carers. Lastly, Lord, we pray for our congregation that we might soon meet again and walk in the way of truth and love. Our prayers are made in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our final hymn today. Um celebrates the fact that Jesus became bright and dazzling high on the mountain. Shine, Jesus, shine.
thanks to everyone who has taken part in our worship today. To Harry for playing the organ, to Alistair for running the sound and video desk, to Harry Johnson for the reading, to Anne and John for their prayers, and to my friend Marcy for her word. Just as Jesus chose to descend the mountain once again, we follow him now back into our world to bring love and service and healing and peace to our community. Whatever you do this week, wherever you go, stay well, stay safe, be blessed. Amen.